First Presbyterian Church, a special welcome to visitors who are with us today, and also those who are worshiping with us online. There are a few announcements in the back, on the back of the bulletin. Please take note of those. As always, after worship, there will be a time of fellowship in the fellowship hall through these doors. And to the left, you are invited and welcome to join with us. After worship in the fellowship hall today, there will be uh, the Deacon's Fundraiser Dinner for Dads, and we'll hear more about that in a moment. Please note there are events coming up today in the afternoon. Deacons and others will be serving the evening meal at my brother's table at Salvation Army and also at Community Cares. The men's breakfast is on Thursday morning and Thursday evening. Dining with Deacons, the monthly fellowship meal is at Pizza Grill this month, and there is a sign-up sheet in the fellowship hall. Please sign up for that event if you plan to attend. And now I'll call on Deacon Vicki Bachman to give us a minute for mission for the dinner for dads.
pictures of Babylon there, we sat down and there we went. And we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our hearts. For there our captors asked us for songs, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? God is spirit. Thank you. 
Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone then who is in Christ is a new creation. Behold, the old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. <laughs>
the heads of the families of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred, got ready to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbors aided them with silver vessels, with gold, with goods, with animals, and with valuable gifts, besides all that was freely offered. King Cyrus himself brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. King Cyrus of Persia had them released into the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this was the inventory. Gold basins, 30, silver basins, 1,000, knives, 29, gold bowls, 30, other silver bowls, 410, other vessels, 1,000. The total of the gold and silver vessels was 5,400. All these Shespets are brought up, and the exiles were brought up from Babylon to Jerusalem. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Make us to know your paths, O Lord. Teach us your ways. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation, and our hope is in you all day long. Pennsylvania 15 years ago last week. It's a little mini anniversary of sorts. An answer to God's call to ministry. And you may have forgotten, but eight years ago, last Sunday, it was for show weekend, but I'll never forget. I accepted this congregation's call to be your pastor. And so Pennsylvania and now Carlisle in many ways feel like home. Though I know I'll never truly be a native. I just don't like hot dogs. <laughs> Early on in ministry, I remember someone telling me that the locals don't really trust you unless they also trusted your grandfather. Both of my grandfathers were good, trustworthy men, but they lived their whole lives in Ohio. Whenever I'm driving west on the turnpike to visit family, I feel like I'm going home. But then a week later, whenever I'm driving east on the turnpike, I also feel like I'm headed home. Home is a complicated idea. It's not just where we live. It's where our roots are, it's where our family is, it's where we come from, and also where we are going. Home, to borrow a well-worn cliché, is where your heart is. In the opening chapter of the book of Ezra, God's people are far, far from home. They've been in exile now for nearly 70 years, carried away by the Babylonians who dominated them for a time, and now by the Persians who have become the empire of the day. They've been carried away from the land of God, away from Jerusalem, away from the temple, away from nearly everything that had come to define them as God's people and give their lives meaning. Now it's not for nothing that God's people are in exile go back and read Kings and Chronicles, you'll find that they have been incredibly disobedient. They broke God's law. A whole string of bad kings had ruled in Jerusalem. They didn't just break God's law, they forgot about it wholesale. They worshipped other gods and did all manner of other kinds of evil. And when the prophets came, when God sent the prophets to call the people back, back to faithfulness, back to obedience, the people laughed at them and shouted at them and ran them out of town. And that was a good day. 
But then the Babylonians showed up on their doorstep, big and powerful and mighty and not to be messed with, and that's when God's people realized that they'd gone a step too far. And they went into exile. We can only really imagine what forced exile might feel like. Maybe your parents had to move to a new state when you're growing up and you resented that, you, you fought against it, you didn't want to leave your family and your friends and your school and all of that, but that's not exactly the same thing as Babylonians showing up on your doorstep one day and ordering you and your family and all of your friends and neighbors at Spear Point to leave everything behind and to march off to some foreign land for God knows how long. And then to add insult to injury, you have to watch as they essentially destroy your homeland, the most important place on earth for you, including the place where you believe God lives. We know a little bit about how those Israelites felt while they were living in captivity. We heard it this morning in the 137th Psalm, which gives us some insight by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. They're incredibly sad. They're talking about hanging their harps on the willow trees. And when the captors asked them for songs, to sing a song of Zion, they said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? But their sadness their anguish also turns to anger because the end of the 137th Psalm is incredibly violent and bloody and maybe it made you squirm a little bit, but the Israelites are angry as well as sad. Exile will do that to a person. Sometimes exile isn't what we might expect. Sometimes you can be in exile and never leave home. The people of God were suffering from a broken relationship with God when they were carried away into exile. And sometimes we face that same reality going out into the hinterlands of our souls, exiled from God. Not in a foreign land, but in a land that feels very foreign to us at times. All this leads to exile. Sometimes we find ourselves in the midst of broken relationships, or the loss of a job, or physical changes in life, or an unexpected diagnosis. And any or all of those things can also feel like being led out into exile. good news is that even in the midst of exile, even in the midst of Babylon, even as they sat hanging their heads down by the rivers of Babylon, God does not abandon his people. When the Babylonians invaded and carried the Israelites off, God didn't just give up on them. God didn't go looking for a new nation to be his chosen people. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, Ezra writes, now King Cyrus is the new kid on the block. He has taken over power from the Babylonians. The, the Persians are the new empire of the day. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, one of the great prophets, in order that the word of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus. That's the first verse that Ezra records. And it begins and ends talking about King Cyrus. And you might have missed it, but the beating heart at the center of that verse, and really the beating heart of the whole story of Ezra and Nehemiah, is right there. The Lord stirred up. In other words, God moved. The Lord God of Israel moves the spirit of King Cyrus to issue an edict to put into writing 
the message that God gave the prophet Jeremiah. And the message is this, your exile will not last forever. God is still with you, and you will go home again one day. Thus says the Lord, when Babylon 70 years are over, I will visit you and fulfill my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm give you a future with hope. Maybe you've heard those words before from the prophet Jeremiah. Maybe you've wondered where they came from, or to whom they were for first spoken, or what they meant for you today. Jeremiah gives these words a future and a hope as a sign to people living far from home, exiled in a foreign land, wondering if they will ever, ever go home again. As King Cyrus issues his edict, it is becoming clearer and clearer that God has not abandoned his people. This return to the promised land is God's doing. It is the Lord who has stirred up, who has moved Cyrus's heart. Without God's movement, in his spirit, it is unlikely that King Cyrus would be quite so magnanimous and let his people go home again. But it turns out you can go home again. Because God, you see, is always in the habit of remembering his people and redeeming his people. Think, if you will, for a moment about how God heard the cries of the Hebrew slaves and delivered them from their oppressors in Egypt and then led them out through the wilderness, purifying them and eventually bringing them to the promised land. The covenant that God has made with the children of Abraham is eternal. God cannot break it. God will not break it. And time and time again, as here in Ezra chapter 1, we see God renewing that covenant, bearing witness to that covenant, restoring his people, remaining faithful to them, even when they are not faithful to him. That's the thing about God. God remains faithful to his people, to us, to you, and to me, even when we are less than faithful. Even when we are less than faithful, God doesn't give up on us. And then in Jesus Christ, the covenant expands, and all who believe, regardless of where they come from, regardless of their nationality, all who believe, will be saved. In the New Testament, Jesus most often uses parables to teach the people who follow him, who surround him, who come to him. And one of the best known parables tells a story about a father with two sons. And the younger son comes to his father one day and asks for his inheritance early, a real slap in the face, because he's saying, Dad, I'd rather you were dead. Give me my share. And the father, because he loves his son, gives him the money. And the young son goes off and squanders the money in what the Bible calls dissolute living. You can use your imagination. And after he runs out of money, a famine hits the land where this young man has gone to live. And the young man finds himself well and truly living in exile, away from everything he's ever known or loved. And he's forced to take the only job he can find, slopping hogs. And he knows that he has scraped bottom. He knows that he has gone all the way down and can go no further when he is so hungry that even the hog slop begins to look good. Jesus says, in the middle of the parable, that's when the young man finally comes to himself. 
we might say, came to his senses. I think it was a Holy Spirit moment. God moved. God stirred him up, this prodigal son. I can try going home, he says. My father is still rich. He has plenty of servants who never have ever gone hungry. Maybe, just maybe, if I go home and confess my sin, then maybe, just maybe, Dad would let me work for him as a slave. At least then I wouldn't starve. Now we know that's not how the story ends. While the son is still far away off, the father sees his wayward son coming home and runs to him with open arms and a ring and a coat and throws him a huge party, much to the chagrin of the older brother. God moved, you see. God stirred him up to go home. Because going home meant wholeness and healing and restoration. Ezra and Nehemiah tell the story of God's people going home and rebuilding their lives, rebuilding their faith, rebuilding the temple and the city of Jerusalem, finding that wholeness, that healing, all at the same time. Now, none of this is going to be easy. Going home be hard. Some of the Israelites who were carried away to Babylon never did go home. Some of them died in Babylon. Some of them said, I'm not going home, and they continued to live in Babylon and in Persia and to practice their faith in foreign lands. Going home for the prodigal son also wasn't easy. He had scraped bottom. He didn't have any other option. In both of these cases, God is at work in the hearts and the lives of unexpected people, stirring them up, moving them to bring about redemption and reconciliation. Because that's who God is. That's what God does. How is God at work in your life? Are you feeling as though you're in exile today, longing to go home again? Have you scraped bottom and no place to go? Are you struggling to sing songs in a foreign land? Wait, listen. Perhaps God is using an unexpected voice to announce the end of your exile. A new path, a new way, a new way home. It is the Spirit of God that moves both the powers of this earth and of God's own people into action. And the Spirit of God does this for one purpose, so that our relationships might be restored, so that we can love the way Jesus taught us to love, God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and each other as we love ourselves. Because that's what God does. And that's who God is. You can go home again. Amen.
Confession of Faith today is God's Invitation, written for the Church of Scotland. It is printed in your bulletins. Let us affirm what we believe. God made the world and all its creatures, with men and women made in his image. By breaking his laws, evil have broken contact with God and damaged his good world. This we see and sense in the world and in ourselves. The Bible tells us the good news that God still loves us and has shown his love uniquely in his Son, Jesus Christ. He lived among us and died on the cross to save us from our sin. But God raised him from the dead. In his love, this living Jesus invites us to turn from our sins and enter by faith into a restored relationship with God, who gives true life for and beyond death. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, remaking us like Jesus, we with all Christians worship God, enjoy His friendship, and are available for Him to use in sharing and showing His love, justice, and peace locally and globally until Jesus returns. In Jesus' name, we gladly share with you God's message for all people. You are Strengthen 
this congregation and its work and worship, O oh God, fill our hearts with your self-giving love, that our voices may speak your praise, and that our lives may be conformed daily to the image of your Son. Nourish us with your word and with the sacraments, that we may faithfully minister in your name and witness to your love and your grace for all people. Lord, in your mercy. Look with compassion on all who suffer this day. Support with your love those with incurable disease, those unjustly imprisoned, those denied dignity, those who live without hope, those who are homeless and abandoned. As you have moved toward us in love, O oh God, so lead us to be present with them in their suffering. In the name of Jesus Christ, who came and suffered with us and for us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Sustain those among us who need your healing touch, O God. Make the sick whole. Give hope to the dying. Comfort those who mourn. Uphold all who suffer in body or mind, not only those whom we know and love, but also those known only to you, that they may know the peace and joy of your supporting care. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O oh God, in your loving purpose, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. In all things for which we pray this day and always, give us the will to seek to bring them about for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts.
together. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. All that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours, and you rule over all. Therefore, Lord, we see in our gifts tangible expressions of our love and gratitude. Transform them into a source of life for me. Thank mm-hmm. you.